Hey, everybody, this is Brian back with another episode of Grief to Growth. And today I've got with me my friend Mark Anthony. Uh, Mark is known as the psychic explorer or the psychic lawyer. He's a fourth generation psychic medium who communicates with spirits. He's an Oxford educated attorney, licensed to practice law in Florida, Washington, D.C., and before the United States Supreme Court. He recently won the AMI Award for Best Psychic Medium. He appears nationwide on, on TV and radio, including CBS's The Doctors, Gaia's TV, Beyond Belief. He co-hosts the live stream show, The Psychic and the Doc, on the Transformation Network. Um, he travels to mystical locations to remote corners of the world to examine ancient mysteries and supernatural phenomena. He's a featured speaker at conferences, expos, and universities, which include Brown, Columbia, Harvard, and Yale. He's the author of three best-selling books, The Afterlife Frequency, has won multiple awards and ranked as one of the top books about faith, and was up for a Pulitzer. His other best-selling books are Never Letting Go and Evidence of Eternity. He's also a VIP executive contributor for Best Holistic Life magazine. And as I said, Mark is also happens to be a friend of mine. And what we want to do today, I want to talk with Mark about mediumship and how it works, why you can have confidence in it. And I can't think of a better person to talk to about any questions about mediumship. Mark is uh, one of the best mediums I know. He also, I was talking with someone earlier today and I said, Mark knows a little bit about everything. And that's actually not true. Mark knows a lot about everything. So uh, with that, I want to welcome to the show, Mark Anthony. Thank you, Brian. I, I always enjoy working with you. So it's an honor to be here on your show. Yeah, I, I I appreciate having you back again. And I want to refer people, if you if you haven't heard it, I did another episode with Mark earlier. We talked about Mark's life and about his book, The Afterlife Frequency, and that kind of stuff. But today, I really want to focus down on, on mediumship and, and the like mechanics that. of mediumship and why people can have faith that it's actually real. Uh, and I was telling Mark before we started recording, I get this question a lot. You know, why can't mediums do certain things? Why... Uh, no, how does it all work? So uh, I just want to throw that open to you, Mark, and just get your thoughts on it. Well, there's a, there's a lot to that question. Sure. Um, first off, let, let's back up a bit and let me explain the scientific basis for mediumship. Is that, would that be okay? That'd be awesome. Yes. In my book, The Afterlife Frequency, the subtitle of the book is The Scientific Proof of Spiritual Contact and How That Awareness Will Change Your Life. And the reason that I wrote this book, Brian, is because throughout my life, I mean, I grew up this way. My dad was a NASA engineer. My mother was a commercial artist. It runs for generations in my family. You know, we weren't running around with turbans, waving Ouija boards and flinging granola at people. Uh, yeah, we were a, a all-American sort of <laughs> family mm -hmm. next door, <laughs> except that, you know, my parents and I could see dead people. And uh, my brother and sister can foresee future events. So, so we were a bit different in the neighborhood. But a lot of people doubt the existence of, of mediumship. And the reason that I wrote The Afterlife Frequency and the reason that, that we're, we're here today is that all the different forms of spirit communication, uh, whether it is mediumship, visitations where you may have a dream where a loved one comes to you, and this applies to people who aren't mediums, whether it's a near-death experience, which have been reported for thousands of years and certainly studied very heavily in the last uh, half century, shared death experiences, deathbed visions, out-of-body experiences. Traditionally, they've all been looked at as like a salad bar. They're all different phenomena, but they're not. And I started seeing through my work as a medium, through my work as an attorney who specialized in head injury, neurological and brain, uh, brain injuries. And then uh, when I started studying with quantum physics, it all tied together. All of those different forms of spirit contact, what I call interdimensional communication, Brian, they're all based on the same sound scientific principles. It's not magic. It's not hocus pocus. Everything can be explained through quantum physics. And every great belief system since the sages of ancient India, um, through Zoroaster, Moses, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Lao Tzu, Native American spirituality, the animistic religions of Africa and the Caribbean, uh, they all 
teach a universal constant that the soul, the spirit, the who and what we are pre-exists our body, comes into the body, and then moves on after the body dies. And we know that everything is made of molecules, which in turn are composed of atoms, which are made of electrons, protons, and neutrons, which are made of a smaller particle of pure electromagnetic energy known as a quantum, ergo the term quantum physics. We know from the laws of thermodynamics in physics, energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. So this neuroscience is the study of the human brain. And neuroscientists have discovered that the brain only accounts for 2% of the body's weight, yet it's the most complex electrical system in the body, and therefore it uses over 20% of the body's electrical energy. The heart uses uh, the most, which makes sense because it's a pump and it's going all the time, and we want it to be going all the time because when it doesn't, you'll be talking to the people that I do. <laughs> um, but, but, I, I spent years examining this and studying the different forms of spirit contact, near-death experiences, shared death experiences, the visitations, the mediumship. And by combining physics and faith, I developed the term the electromagnetic soul, the EMS, to define in 21st century terms what we really are, which is pure consciousness that is eternal electromagnetic energy. Now, I know that that's a lengthy explanation, and of course, when you ask a lawyer what time it is, <laughs> we'll tell you how to build a clock. But before we get into to the, the basics of mediumship, it's, it's important for people to understand that the other side dimension is, is on a higher vibrational frequency than our material world dimension. I call the zone in between, imagine if you will, a zone in between. I call it the um, the NDE zone, not the twilight zone, but the NDE zone. And why is that? That is because all the forms of, of communication with the other side occur when the afterlife frequency and our material world vibrational frequencies align and they intersect. Hmm. This is also why when people say, well, why doesn't the spirit just tell you this? Why don't they just give you lottery numbers? Why don't they just find the exact location of the body? Why don't they, why don't they, why don't they? Um, if I had a dollar for every why don't they question, I'd, you know, I'd be doing this telecast from my beach house in Maui right now. But, <laughs> but, but leaving all joking aside, spirit communication, mediumship involves communication from another dimension. And this, once again, this is not some fairy tale. Over the past century, starting with Albert Einstein all the way up through Max Tegmark, Emichio Kaku, Stephen Hawking, uh, string theory uh, proposes that there's not just a universe, but there's multiverses. And within those uh, universes, there's different dimensions. And so when a spirit is communicating with me, they're a group of electromagnetic souls. Think of our soul, our electromagnetic soul, Brian, as a drop of water. And when we die, that drop of water leaves the, the brain. See, the brain doesn't create consciousness. It hosts it, much the way a computer hard drive hosts the programs on it. So when the hard drive dies, when our brain dies, the program gets up, uploaded to the spiritual quantum field. So it plunges into this eternal sea of souls, which I also refer to as the collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so then that electromagnetic soul is interlinked with other souls, linked to other souls, and the access to information that they have is, is essentially infinite. So when I am communicating or, or anybody is communicating with a spirit, what's happening there? is the spirit is emitting waves of electromagnetic frequency that align with the brainwave frequency inside my head. And then the electronic or electrical impulse from the spirit gets converted into recognizable concepts based on my memories, feelings, and cultural associations. 
And so, yes, they are just telling us, but since they don't speak a human language, they're speaking electromagnetic frequency, it can be subject to interpretation, ergo, that's why they just don't pop in and hand me six winning Powerball numbers. Not that I haven't asked, <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but so I hope that that in part answers your question. Yeah, it really, it does because um, it's, as you said, and you just explained, I think better than anybody I know, because mediumship, you know, we, we think of sometimes people think mediumship is like woo woo's magic. Right. And then we, we have science on the other hand, and the two never shall meet. And I love the, and you know, it's funny cause I've been, I've been on my own exploration. I just read um, Tom Campbell's theory of everything. I don't know if you ever read those, that series of books, but it's uh, he's, he's a physicist that also went to the Monroe, Monroe Institute. So he's had all these out of body experiences and he brings the two together. So um, we in the West, I think feel like we need a rational explanation, even though, as you said, people for thousands for millennia have yeah. understood this just, it, it works. So I appreciate that explanation. And that, that does answer the question as to why, why don't they just tell you things? You know, I saw a really great movie two nights ago. Um, it was on MGM Classics or whatever. It was called The Gift. And Kate Blanchett, it takes place in this small town in Georgia. And her husband has died. So, and she's a psychic and she does readings for people. And of course, the... Uh, um, the town promiscuous woman, I'm being politically correct here, ends mm -hmm. up getting murdered. And of course, she was married or, or proposed to be married to uh, Greg Kinnear. And there's this redneck who's married to Hillary Swank, who's Canal Reeves. And Canal Reeves doesn't like his wife, Hillary Swank, consulting with this here devil worshiper and, and all this. And, and long story short, um, the um, it, it's Katie Holmes, who's the uh, promiscuous woman. She disappears and nobody can find her. So Greg Kinnear and Katie Holmes' father come to her with the police. And they're like, well, I don't believe in this. Anyway, long story short, she gets a vision and she describes seeing a, a beaten, battered Katie Holmes covered in chains um, hovering around a tree above this pond, which of course belongs to Canal Reeves, um, the redneck who hates her and, and keeps beating on her and threatening her kids to stay away from her. And they dredge the pond and they find her. Long story short, Canal Reeves is on trial. Now, now, Kate Blanchett never said Canal Reeves did it. She just said that she saw this vision and that's where it was. And the scene where the defense attorney is cross-examining her about her ability and, and ripping her apart. Oh, you had a vision. Oh, you had this. And you make money off this. Don't you? I mean, it was so realistic. And, and I'm an attorney and I, I've seen how attorneys in, and I've I've had to in my career, I'm focused on my spiritual work now, go mm -hmm. after somebody. And so I thought that the movie was an extremely accurate depiction of how people treat psychics, how the skeptics are very vicious towards us. Um, and I'm not going to tell you how it ends because it's a really great twist. And I really recommend uh, it's called The Gift starring Kate Blanchett. But um, that's the whole thing about psychic intuition. I have consulted with the police on, on a number of occasions. And I was, when I was on the CBS TV show, The Doctors, they, they talked to me because I actually did a reading for the man who found Kaylee Anthony's body. And a few years ago, that was a very high profile case. Mm -hmm. um, her mother, Casey Anthony, went on trial for supposedly killing her little girl, you know, which she did. But but uh, the um, the state attorney's office in Florida, they overcharged her and they basically botched the case. And so she got off with just a couple of misdemeanors instead of the uh, the murder charge. But what happened there? is I was doing a public event in Florida and I started describing a little girl and I said, I feel like there's mesh, like a, a, some type of mesh on her face and I feel water and I feel a deterioration. And I started describing and this guy stands up crying and he goes, I found Kaylee Anthony's body and she came through to thank him mm -hmm. for, for this. 
and then I, I'll spare spare all the details. But the information that I got was accurate enough um, that he was able to verify. Mm-hmm. And and now, how can I make something like that up to a crowd of people? And what was interesting is. You know, when I was doing the reading for him, I said, why does this guy look familiar? And then when he said, I'm the guy who found Kaylee Anthony's body, I remembered I saw him on TV mm. um, like the year before. And and it, it was it was very, very startling. But the reason that psychics are not put on the witness stand in trial is because of the hearsay rule. Now, hearsay is is an out-of-court statement offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. So in other words, um, this piece of paper would be hearsay unless it meets one of the exceptions uh, and or if the hearsay statement can be subjected to cross-examination. Now, clearly, we can't put a spirit on the witness stand and cross-examine the spirit. Then people will ask, well, how could psychic intuition possibly be useful uh, to the police? Well, maybe they can't put me on the witness stand, but what I can do is give the police information that will point them in the right direction to where then they can find evidence which is not hearsay and which is admissible. And that I've been able to do that on a, on a number of occasions throughout my life. And I know this isn't exactly what you were asking, but I, I think that, that this is a good follow-up to why don't they just tell us? Well, they do tell us, but I may get a glimpse of where it happened. Like in the movie, The Gift, she saw um, the body hovering above the pond mm-hmm. where, where the body died. You know, when I saw the body of Kaylee Anthony, I could feel the dirt, I could feel the, I could smell the water. Uh, and she was found in in a, in a wetland area where the water had gone down a bit. And a truck driver pulled over to relieve himself and he started smelling something. And then he walked over to where it was. He thought it was a dead animal. And he sees the body of this little girl there all duct taped off up, which was the um, the mesh that I felt on her face. So when you when you find the evidence and then you look at what the information was transmitted from the spirit through me to the recipient, then it starts to make sense. And so a lot of times, let's say I'm doing a reading on you and I'm giving you details like this. Initially, they're not going to make sense, but they will or can at some point once it leads you to where the body is or once you have a period of time to reflect on it and then figure out what it means. Yeah, and thank you for explaining that because um, I think again, I people think of when a medium is communicating with the spirit, it's like the spirit walks in, sits down in the chair, the medium looks over, looks, sees the sees the person, and they speak to them in English, and they don't understand the process. And I know it's different for every medium too. Some people have different clairs, and you might want to go into that as well. But I, people need to understand that there is a, a process of interpretation. That, that goes with, with every medium that I've ever known. Uh, this this is true. See, it's not Alexa or Siri. <laughs> uh, you know, people are like, well, just tell me this. You know, some people come to me, they have a whole list of questions. They're going, hold on, hold on. Spirit communication is not a visit to Santa Claus <laughs> where you hop on his lap with a list and start saying, I want this, I want this, I want this. What I do is I open up to frequency. Once again, everything is frequency. And there's five main brainwave frequencies. There's gamma, which is like, that's when you're on final jeopardy and your brain is just cranking to full throttle. Then there's beta. That's the state, Brian, you and I are in right now. It's the activities for daily living. Then when we begin to relax, we go into alpha. Alpha is great. And that's where, you know, you start to drift off, you daydream. That's why a lot of mediums say that when we're engaging in spirit communication, it feels like you're in a daydream because brainwave frequency wise we are because you're going from the alpha to the theta state which is a deep sleep where you dream and then the fifth main brainwave frequency is delta very little activity brainwave wise going on in delta but delta is important because that's where you heal you fight infections so so it serves a purpose but on the alpha theta border you get to a lower megahertz you know because people are always saying oh we must raise our vibration well that's a term of art 
Yes, we must raise our vibration, our aspirations, our inspiration to a higher level. <clears throat> but when it comes to spirit communication, we're quieting the mind. And you're getting between, I think it's between three and like 12 megahertz, which would be a boo, a very deep bass sound. Mm -hmm. And so a spirit can see that. And he, she, or a group of them will lower their frequency and align with the brainwave frequency of the recipient at the alpha theta border. This is why the most common form of spirit communication occurs in dreams. Because when you're in that deep dream state is ideal for spirit communication, spirits spot that. They zoom in, they align. And you can tell, and, and what's really wonderful about, about the frequency alignment here is you don't have to be a medium to experience it. So many people come out of a dream saying, you know, I, I really felt that that my, my daughter talked to me in my dream and it felt real. And it's mm -hmm. different than a regular dream. Regular dreams have all that surrealistic quality. All of a sudden your toaster turns into a you know pterodactyl and flies around the room. Or, you know, we, I know you're laughing because we've all had those what right, right. You know, so wait, wait, what and then there's those visitations where that was a real conversation you can tell the difference because the contact experience has a beginning a middle and an end and it's coherent and it and because it is a coherent contact so for some reason that we still don't understand mediums like myself are able to go to the beta alpha theta border within seconds Normally, it takes the brain um, a, a, a period of time and relaxation to get into that mega low megahertz zone, which is conducive to spirit communication. But mm -hmm. for some reason, I can do it while I'm in the beta state and I flip into alpha theta. Um, it's also why mediumship is very exhausting. Um, mediums generally will only do one, maybe two readings a day. Um, you know, or more if they're 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 shorter. But um, there is a whole process based on our physiology, based on quantum free, uh, quantum physics, and based on frequency alignment, which allows spirit communication to happen. Yeah, that's a wonderful explanation. And you just touched on something else that uh, I think is really interesting about mediums. I have friends that are mediums that can literally only do one reading a day or they get sick. Um, and, and I know a lot of mediums suffer from certain ailments, autoimmune diseases, uh, yeah. et cetera. So there is, there is something going on with the body. And I know mediums in labs have been hooked up and they expect their brains to light up and it's actually the opposite. Their brains get very quiet. Um, so I think the brain, and I'm sure you know more about this than I do, but the brain is more of a, a filter and a receiver than it is a generator of consciousness. And it's like getting the brain out of the way almost. Exactly. Exactly. And it's fascinating when you um, talk to people, um, very spiritual people, uh, when you talk about uh, to Christians who talk about Christ consciousness, uh, what they're talking about is the same as what Hindus talk about with Krishna consciousness and Buddhists talk about as a state of enlightenment. And you hit the nail right on the head no pun intended, Brian, that we got to get the brain out of the way. You got to get the self out of the way so that there's this energetic connection with the spirit. And that that's why the people who scoff at this, we live in an immediate gratification society where you go up to an ATM, you punch a couple buttons and money spits out. You go to Alexa, tell me this, or you grab your phone and ask it a question and it tells you things, It which is which is miraculous it is. and a and, and hundred years ago if you told somebody that you'd have this little canister in your house you could go alexa play my favorite music and it would light up in your favorite music they would look at you like you were insane or try to explain a microwave oven to somebody in the year 1920 they they would think that was that was absolute fantasy so we live with all this miraculous technology around it and we don't give it a second thought. So <clears throat> why is spirit communication so bizarre? And I'll, I'm going to explain something. <clears throat> Think about what goes into a cell phone call. 
you want to talk to your Aunt Martha, and she lives in London. So your brain sends an electronic impulse to your vocal cords, so electrical energy, and, and it sends another impulse to your um, lungs. So the electrical impulse to your lungs converts, remember, energy is never created or destroyed, only transferred. Electrical mm -hmm. impulse to your lungs converts electrical energy to muscular energy, which contracts shooting uh, air out through your mouth. And the other electrical impulse con is converted into mechanical energy as your vocal cords begin to vibrate. So then sound wave energy comes out of your mouth and the sound wave then hits the plate inside of your cell phone and the sound wave energy gets converted to mechanical energy, which hits a, a wire, converting it into electrical energy, which then hits the antenna, converting the electrical energy to radio wave energy. The radio wave energy then hits a tower, converting that into electrical energy, which then runs it through miles of wires to a huge antenna, converting the electrical energy back into radio wave energy, which is then beamed up to a satellite. The satellite then takes a radio wave energy, turns it into microwave energy, and it bounces off a series of satellites until it locates the correct one that converts that microwave energy back into radio wave energy, which goes beams down to a collection point in England, taking that microwave energy, turning it into electrical energy, running it through miles of wires to a tower, converting it back into radio wave energy, which then hits the antenna on Aunt Martha's cell phone, taking the radio wave energy, turning it into electrical energy, then converting it into mechanical energy, which hits the vibrational plate, which then is converted into sound wave energy, which hits her eardrum, therefore converting it into mechanical energy, which then causes the um, state bones in the middle ear to hit the eighth cranial nerve, converting mechanical energy into electrical energy, which then goes into the brain, and she hears, hi, this yeah. is Mark, Aunt Martha, and all of that, Brian, occurs at the speed of light because everything in the electromagnetic spectrum moves at 186,282 miles per second. Mm -hmm. So we can do this every day, and we do it all the time, but I can't talk to spirits? Yes, and that's fantastic. That is, I, I love that, I, that that detailed breakdown of the miracle that we live with every day. Every and, day. It, and if you tried to explain that to someone, as you said, 100 years or 200 years ago, they would have said that's impossible. If you tried to explain radio waves, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I just been doing all this reading lately about this and I, I just found out i guess dark matter and dark energy weren't discovered until like 1998 if Precisely. you could even call it discovered because still no one knows what it is what it is and and over 90 percent of the multiverses is dark matter dark energy which means that over 90 percent of creation is beyond our ability to perceive it. Yes. And but, I think that this yeah. is a really important point because I, I wish I could remember the exact quote, and I need to look it up because Neil deGrasse Tyson was quoted, and I didn't hear it from his mouth. But as they were, you know, he doesn't believe in God. He's, you know, he's a, he's a total materialist. And yeah. he was like, you know, if, if there's something that I can't see that we can't interact with, that we can't prove exists, then that sounds like it's made up to me. Something to that effect. And I was reading this book about dark matter and dark energy. I'm like, that sounds like the definition of dark matter and dark energy. But physicists readily accept that dark matter and dark energy is real. Um, sure. And when it comes to mediumship, because we can't explain it yet, people say, well, therefore, it must not exist. Exactly. And, and to paraphrase uh, Dr. Tyson, because I, I admire Neil deGrasse Tyson. I do, too. And, and um, it's unfortunate that he doesn't believe in God, um, but that's his choice, and everybody has that choice. He said, the beauty of science is that you don't have to believe it for it to be true. And the beauty of the afterlife is that you don't have to believe in it for it to be true. I've conducted over 15,000 readings in my lifetime. I grew up with parents who saw spirits. This is literally part of my DNA. The things that I have witnessed, been part of, um, been honored to transmit for people, I can't possibly make these things up. It is astounding some of the things uh, that come through. 
And, you know, people are like, oh, my God, how did you know that? And it's like, I don't, but they <laughs> do. Right. Right. Well, that's, you know, and the thing is, I am, a, I'm a rational person. I'm a chemical engineer by training. And, you know, again, I, I get excited when I see that science is is catching up. But I have to say to myself, you know, Brian, you, I, I keep wanting to have to use my logical, rational mind to understand this. And that's great. I think we can do that. But I also believe that we need to understand or give credit to people's experiences. And I've known people like you, I've been fortunate to know people like you personally, and I've, and I've been witness to your some of your readings. And I've got other friends that are just, you know, like you said, how would the person that called me on the phone about my daughter know what perfume she had in her room when I didn't know what perfume she had in her room? How would they know what my wife was thinking at the hospital the day my daughter passed away? My wife had literally not shared that with anybody. So yeah. a lot of times people say, well, it's all cold reading or they looked you up on the internet. But I know you've got stories of things that people couldn't possibly, you couldn't have possibly looked up. Yeah, I, I was doing a reading for this woman recently and her husband's spirit comes through. And I always tell people that your interpretation of something is more important than mine. And all of a sudden he says to me, igloo. And I'm like, igloo? And I live in Florida. It's literally right now 100 degrees outside. Igloos are not a thing here. And I'm like, igloo? And she goes, oh, my God, which is always a great thing for a medium to hear. And I said, all yeah. right, how, how does that make sense? She said, Mark, our daughter is currently in Alaska because she's getting married there. And she called me on the phone yesterday, and she told me that her wedding planner used to live in an igloo. Hmm. She goes, I think that's it. And I'm going, I'm pretty sure that's it now. Let's take a, a step back here. The igloo. First off, when a spirit transmits information to a medium, the information isn't always about the spirit. Initially, they'll come in and give identifiers. Like, they'll, you know, I love it because you know, I'll see things, hear things, feel things, know things. Um, mm -hmm. But here he gave me an igloo. That had nothing to do with her husband when he was in this world, but what he was telling her is, I am around you, I am around our daughter, and I know that she's getting married, and yeah. to prove it, I'll bring up this weird fact about her wedding planner, an igloo. So when messages from spirits come through, it's always great, because that was, a, you know, we were laughing about that, the client and I, because it was one of those wow moments, but then it's after the reading when you start really analyzing things. Also, um, did we talk about the last time I was on your show about the timeless timelessness? Um, I think we did, but let's do it again. Okay. Yeah. Back to the electromagnetic soul, back to quantum. Okay. Albert Einstein theorized, and this is still um, being discovered, being explored, and is still what quantum theorists believe, is that there is no time on the quantum level. So you go from molecules to atoms, to electrons, protons, and neutrons to a quantum. And for and you're a chemical engineer, so I'll say this for the benefit of everybody. Technically, an electron is a quantum because it's one eighteen hundredth the size of a proton. It's just a negatively charged quantum. All right, so now we made all the physics people happy. But Einstein said on the quantum level that time doesn't exist past, present, and future are occurring simultaneously. Now, that sounds nice in a science fiction TV show or movie, and that sounds nice in the theoretical sense. But how is it then that spirits can see future events? I was doing a reading for a woman, and her mother's spirit came through and started to talk to me about a seven-year-old boy in this world who's alive and that he needed to go to the eye doctor. And she said, well, I don't have any children, but my sister's little boy is seven years old and I'm very close to my nephew and to my sister. And he has been complaining of headaches a lot lately. I said, well, your mother wants you to, you and your sister, get him to an eye doctor. And then all of a sudden I start singing, tutti fruity, all rudy, tutti fruity. And I get this whole little Richard song go, okay, what's up with little Richard? She goes, nothing. She said, I, you know, guys, I know who he was, but, you know, we're not fans. I've heard of the song, but it means nothing to me. And, and I've been doing this long enough to where I tell people, if you don't get it, don't sweat it. I said, just jot it down. Don't worry about it. 
Well, then two weeks later, Brian, she calls me and she said, Mark, you're not going to believe this. And I always love it when people tell me that because, you know, she said, I called my sister and I said, you know, we got to get him to the doctor because this medium said this. And, and my sister said, all right, let's do it. So she made an appointment for the eye doctor and my sister, myself and my nephew. The second we walked into the doctor's office on the radio starts playing Tutti Frutti Ah Rudy by Little Richard. Mm. Now, for you skeptics out there, please do the odds of that happening out of every single song that's ever been written or recorded. Right, right. That's the one I got. Now, let's analyze this through the electromagnetic soul theory. Electromagnetic soul, pure quantum energy, according to theory of relativity, past, present, and future is occurring simultaneously, which is why a spirit can see what we call future events. Radio waves are a form of electromagnetic energy so that EMS was tying into a future event to the, the song, which would be broadcast through electromagnetic energy at the precise moment that they walked into the doctor's office. And this is how spirits will validate for the recipient that you're doing the right thing. That's why I'm giving you this song. You don't know what it means yet, but when you hear it, you will know. I think we're past a billion to one on this. Yes, absolutely. And I've, I've had those experiences too, where a medium yeah. has told me something and it's been a year and a half before it made sense to me. And it's a long story. I won't tell it here. I've told it many times before, but I had a, I had a, a reading with someone. It was a, it was a test reading. It was blind. I had no idea who I was. And they mentioned me traveling. They mentioned me speaking. And I had never traveled to speak at that point. And I did. It was the Helping Parents Hill Conference that you and I were both at in Arizona last year. And on the plane, on the way back, a series of events led me to listen to that reading recording just at the moment the plane was taking off out of Arizona and, and listening to her say that I was going to be doing this. I was going to be going somewhere speaking, flying on a plane and speaking behind a podium. This was a year and a half before it happened. And I, I, had never, I had never done that before. And she had no idea who I was. So again, you talk about, this is not something where people say something that's general, like I have your grandmother here and she says she loves you. Yeah. Oh, and she baked cookies. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, most grandmothers probably bake cookies. I, I was doing a reading one time and I said, your grandmother's coming through and she said that she was a lousy cook. And the client said, God, granny's cooking was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> No, that was funny. I didn't expect that. But yeah, your grandmother's here and she loves you. Well, I think most grandmothers love their grandkids. I mean, that's kind of how it goes. And I remember when I was uh, I was working with some British mediums and one of them, he used to be um, a jockey. So he comes prancing into the class. He was English. And he said, we're going to avoid the four assumed dialogues. Number one, that the spirits are with you. Number two, they love you. Number three, they bring you joy. Number four, they bring you upliftment. And then he looked right at me, and I was the only American there. And he goes, oh, and you Americans, when all else fails, do pull out a Native American spirit, why don't you? Will there be no Pocahontas or Hiawatha in this class? And I'm sitting there like, God, this is like, Professor Snape right out of Harry Potter. I mean, I'm trying not to laugh, but he had a very, very good point. And what he said, he said, the four assumed dialogues, people need to hear that. Okay, mm -hmm. yes, that your loved ones are with you. They love you. They want you to feel joy and uplifted. He said, but that's not enough. He said, anybody could say that. He said, evidential mediumship, you have to verify those things by bringing through facts in details mm -hmm. that far exceed some generalized thing. Um, but there's a saying, um, and I believe a, a saint said it, and it was in connection with Bernadette Subaru um, in Lourdes, France. And that happened over 100 years ago. There was this young girl who um, saw several visions of a lady of light, and the Catholic Church came in and did it an investigation, and they said this was a real phenomenon. They identified her as 
as the uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, although Bernadette never said that. She said the Lady mm -hmm. of Light. But at any rate, what came out of that was a saying that for those who believe, no proof is necessary. For those who do not, no proof may be possible. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was doing an event. It was at a symposium um, at a college. And one of the other speakers, um, she's a, a scientist, um, and her sister was there, who's a complete non-believer. And I was doing a mediumship demonstration. And I remember I was getting names, causes of death. I mean, this the, this couple stood up and I said, Walter, Walter's coming through. My uncle Walter just died. And I started talking about Walter and and walnut trees. Oh my God, he grew walnut trees. All right. So, I mean, I was getting very specific details because I can't look at somebody and go, you know, I bet they had an uncle Walter who died who grew walnut trees. All right. 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 Well, the scientist's sister said, oh, he was so general. Anyone could have said those things because she wasn't a skeptic. Skeptics are open-minded. They may not believe something, but they're looking for proof. She's a cynic. Yes. Cynical people are closed-minded. I'm and they'll go, I'm very skeptical. No, you're not skeptical, you're cynical and you're closed-minded. Yes. Because when somebody is producing that type of evidence, that type of proof, and I'll never forget um as well that whole night. And I was in Arizona, I was actually in Sedona, Arizona, and everything about Orlando, Orlando, something terrible in Orlando was coming up, and it wasn't resonating with everybody. And and when I got back to my hotel room and I turned on the TV, the Pulse nightclub shooting oh, in Orlando, it happens like 50 people were machine gunned down by some right. maniac. And that's what that was. So so that was sending out such a, a huge vibration through the quantum field. Right. I was picking up on it. It's it's kind of like um and I'm sure most people have seen the first Star Wars when the Death Star destroys the planet Alderaan and, and Obi-Wan Kenobi says there's a great disruption in the force as mm -hmm. if millions of voices crying out. And it's, you know, you can look at that on one hand and laugh about it, or you can look at it in a very different way, because that is what happens. And the reason I'm bringing that up, who created Star Wars? George Lucas. When George Lucas was 16 years old, he was in a car accident and he died. He was flatlined. And then he was resuscitated something like almost 20 minutes later. They were working on him so much. Hmm. Within three years of that, he had his first draft of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Now, the force is an energy field which interconnects and binds everything in the universe. Hello, quantum yeah. physics. Yeah. And one of the side effects of a near-death experience, or several side effects, one is a sense of interconnectedness. When you when you have an NDE and you're, you're, you die and your soul leaves your body, and, and then they resuscitate you and your EMS returns, people say they, they return with a feeling of interconnectedness. One of the other side effects is enhanced psychic ability. So when you start to look at star wars and you look at the force the jedi represent the positive aspects of mm -hmm. of an nde and the bad guys darth vader and his whole crew are representations of the ego which is which is created by the brain the spirit is not created by the brain therefore it is tied into the positive energy of the quantum field but the the ego edging God out is materialism, self-centered, aggression, and it's all the negative things. And, and it is my firm belief, and I write about this in my book, and I've given lectures on this, that Star Wars is an inspiration or was, was inspired by a near-death experience, which is one of the forms of spirit interdimensional communication explainable by the electromagnetic soul theory. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to I want to piggyback on there, and and I and I think that's why Star Wars has such universal appeal, and why it has such deep, rich themes in it that we all resonate with and, and are entertained by, without even realizing why we're entertained by it. 
but you mentioned the Pulse nightclub, you mentioned the Death Star, bringing this back to science like we were talking about before, when a, a world event happens like 9-11, uh, like tsunamis and things, random number generators around the world go crazy. And yep. nobody can explain why that happens. There are these random, for people who don't know, these generators are set up that basically, it's like flipping a coin. It's always 50-50, and they're always just kind of smooth moving along. But when these events happen, something in the human psyche is triggering a an event that is recorded electromagnetically. Perfect. Perfect. And that also underscores that we're all interconnected. Yeah, uh, You know, all the great spiritual teachers have always said that we're all brothers and sisters. And, you know, I, I was raised uh, believing believing that, and I still do believe that. Um, I love what Gandhi said one time. He said, we're all the children of God, so why do people raise their hands against their brothers and sisters simply because they call God by another name? Mm -hmm. And... And, you know, as much as we'd all like to join hands and sing Kumbaya worldwide, and, and um, I'm a student of history, and I don't really see that ever happening. I mean, something major would, would have to occur for, for that to happen. But it is very fascinating when we study near-death experiences, no matter who these people are, when they come out of it, they're changed. Right. And they, I'm an end year. I was four years old, but when people come out of the NDE, they have the sense that we're all interconnected. They have enhanced psychic ability. They believe in a timelessness. Okay, that that time isn't isn't all that important. Um, they tend to believe in reincarnation. And as uh, Nancy Evans Bush, I love Nancy Evans Bush. She is one of the original crew, um, along with Raymond Moody and Bruce Grayson and Kenneth Ring. That, that started the International Association for Near-Death Studies, mm -hmm. she said that NDEers, near-death experiencers, don't, don't think there's a God. They know there's a God. Right. Right. And because when they return from the experience, and um, I mean, we could get off into talking about that, but um, the way I, I, I don't believe in God as an erotic white guy sitting on a throne with a scepter, smiting people and telling you, you got to be bad, you got to be afraid. The, those are artistic depictions throughout the medieval era. And it was funny. I had a friend from Germany, and he said, well, Jesus had blonde hair and blue eyes. And I'm like, wow. okay. So so look at a, a picture of a painting of Jesus in Greece. He kind of looks Greek, doesn't he? Look at a, a painting of Jesus in France. He kind of looks French, doesn't he? You know, people anthropomorphize the infinite. And this is a, a fascinating thing in near-death experiences. Christians. Um, and, and here's why I believe this is happening. The electromagnetic soul, the EMS, is leaving the, the human body. It's leaving the brain, and the brain is designed for finite perception only because mm -hmm. we're living in a finite world. And so as the EMS is transitioning to the infinite and now touching the, the collective consciousness, you know, we're in the NDE zone, but it's getting closer to the infinite. There is a shift between finite to infinite perception. And some people will, will go through a tunnel in the light. Most people do. They'll encounter deceased loved ones. And there's stages to an NDE depending on how long it goes on. And some people will get to the point of the threshold of the divine. Christians will see Christ. Hindus will see Shiva, Vishnu, uh, you know, Hindu deities. Mm -hmm. Japanese Shintos will see Amarasu. Buddhists may see Buddha, so on and so forth. Why is that? It's because the EMS is still operating on a finite filter, and it's easier for you and I, Brian, to relate to the infinity, the love, the, the vast energy that is God as the person Jesus mm -hmm. than it is a quantum field that always was, always will be, and permeates everything. And, and so that's why when I hear people say, well, everything that happened uh, that I saw was in scripture. It's like, well, then talk to some Hindus. They said, well, I, I, I met Vishnu. Yeah. Okay. And, and um, the, the interesting thing is in the readings that I do, and people say, well, is there a God? And the spirits will respond. And they always say, yes, but so beyond anything you were taught 
and so far beyond anything that you can even comprehend, and yet so simple too, because it's, it's well, I don't want to refer to God as it, but the divine is an energy, a quantum energy that permeates us from the subatomic level on up, and that feeling of love is part of it, is right. part of it. So if you want to feel God, it's love. And it's not creepy stalker love. It's like, you know, somebody you really love who loves you. When you, the Hindus have a saying that when you look in the eyes, you look into the eyes of someone you love who loves you back, that's God. Yeah, God is a, is a, is a really crazy concept because we go from, you know, a little kid in Sunday school being taught God is a white man on the throne, blah, blah, blah. And we anthrop- totally anthropomorphize God. And then we go to the spiritual that says it's God is a spirit or God is love. And then we get to the the quantum that says God is a force or a field. Um, And that all kind of depersonalizes God. But people that have in the E say God is love. And the only thing that we know that can love is is personal. So it's, it's a very difficult thing, I think, for the human mind to understand this transpersonal love that loves everybody and everything equally yeah it, it, absolutely and and you know i don't pretend to have the answers i have insights yeah um, i love the way albert einstein described it he said when trying to understand the universe think of yourself as a four-year-old child who wanders into a library and you see all the books, and you know that there's things written in the books, and you know that somebody wrote them, but you don't understand what it is. He said, That's, I love that. Yeah. I love that. We we think we know so much. And I've again I've been reading all these scientific things recently. And even if you just look at the fact that dark matter and dark energy are 95% of the universe, that means we're only looking at 5% of it. And then I was reading something the other day that says that the universe is actually infinite. So we're they, this guy was arguing we're looking at zero percent of it because, you know, any percentage of, of, of infinite is zero. My point is, we don't know much of anything. We we are just starting to try to try to grasp things. So when people say that certain things are impossible, and I love the analogy we you and I both talked about earlier, the, even just the internet today, if you explain this to somebody a hundred years ago, they would have said it's impossible. So when we understand, when we talk about afterlife communications, the way I, look, I tell people, I don't believe there is any supernatural. It's just what we don't understand yet. Right. Uh, yeah. We always throw a label, magic, supernatural, paranormal. Um, the paranormal is really normal and the supernatural is really natural. And being afraid of the presence of spirits is like being afraid of the grass because it's green or the sky because it's blue. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, they're there they exist. Mm -hmm. And once again, just because you don't understand something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because people say all the time, you can't do that, you can't do that. And usually I don't waste my time with those people. But Mm -hmm. when I do, I say, well, by all means, please tell me your vast understanding of um, electromagnetic energy, the quantum spiritual field, interdimensional communication, and the ability to adjust your brainwave frequencies to align with that of the collective consciousness. And they're like, you know, so I I don't, I don't waste, waste my time with people like that. Um, I prefer to spend my time um, helping people who are open-minded understand it. There's always going to be the naysayers. There's always going to be, be the negative people who are going to refute things and people, why believe in science is so do I. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I want to say, I, I want to, um, so you, you mentioned skeptics and cynics earlier, and I, I tell people that all the time. There's a skeptic, and there's a, we're here to address the, the skeptics. We're here to address the people that are open-minded, maybe the people that want to believe, the people that say, I, I, I want to believe, but I, I don't want to be gullible. Um, and, and you gave an example I want to go back to earlier when you mentioned Walter and the walnut tree. Yeah. And so... There are a lot of mediums, and, and unfortunately, there are frauds. There are bad mediums. There are good mediums, and there are great mediums, just like anything else. Right. So there's some mediums that will say, I'm getting a J name. Well, J names are extremely common. Oh, yeah. that must be my Uncle Jack. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's Jack. Or, yeah. or your grandmother baked cookies. There's a difference between 
getting a specific name like Walter and a walnut tree, um, but between saying I'm getting your grandmother and she baked cookies, or I'm getting a, an M name. Um, right. I was at a mediumship demonstration once and this woman gave several pieces of evidence. And one was this person grew roses and they were white roses. Um, the thing is interesting. First of all, not only is that very specific, there were like three people in the room whose grandmother grew white roses. So it's interesting how, how spirit will like piggyback and give evidence that sometimes it, that uh, even though it's a very rare piece of evidence, it applied to like three people. That's what I refer to as collective consciousness communication. And that's where spirits with a commonality will come through together. And oftentimes the recipients will also have a commonality. Mm -hmm. And in that case, a grandmother who grew white roses, well, all the grannies that grew white roses, their spirits were coming through. And then the commonality was uh, the recipients who were there. And then what will happen is when the medium, when, when I lock on to a particular person, then their granny will start giving them specific messages. Then we're going to arc over to the next one, arc over to the next one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I've seen that this happens. I, I always, this is part of, of what I explained before my, my um, uh, public demonstrations is collective consciousness communication. Uh, because a lot of times people are like, well, I heard that, but I didn't raise my hand. And it's like, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite, or one of my favorite, uh, didn't raise my hand stories. My manager, Rocky, and I, we were driving through West Virginia because we were going to um, Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And I'm humming. And I'm like, and she goes, would you stop humming that Pirates of the Caribbean song? And I go, what? And I didn't even realize it. I was humming, yo, ho, yo, ho, because I get a lot of songs, you know. And and uh, and then all of a sudden, I realized why I was doing that. And I saw an elderly gentleman clutching his chest. And I saw like a flash of a red. It looked like a, a vintage Corvette. And, and and then I and I go, I think it could be a spirit. And then a couple of minutes later, I'm, huh, huh, huh. And Rocky goes, if you don't stop humming that, I swear to God, I'll make you walk the plank. All right, so we're laughing. Um, we get to Pittsburgh, and later that night, I'm doing a spirit communication event. This is roughly about, it was about 75, 80 people. It was a smaller venue, and I like the smaller venues because I can get to get to more people. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, it starts happening. Yo, ho, yo. So I'm singing to the crowd. I go, Pirates of the Caribbean, make sense, anyone? Nobody says a thing. I go, um, Pirates? Johnny Depp? Red Corvette? Grandfather with heart attack? Anything? Yo, ho? <laughs> Nothing. Everyone's just staring at me. And I, and I said, okay, let me move on. Well, when the event was over, there was an 18-year-old girl who worked there, and she walked up and goes, oh, that was like my grandfather, but I thought I'd look silly if I said anything. Okay, so me standing up in front of almost 100 people singing Pirates of the Caribbean, yeah, yeah. You, know, for, you know, my first inclination is like I was about to get angry, but then I realized let's not do that because it's not about me. All right, I said, what's up with Pirates of the Caribbean? She goes, well, I really love Johnny Depp. And my grandfather was going to take me to Disney World because I wanted to go on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Okay. But he died of a heart attack two weeks before we never got to go. And I go, what's with the red vintage Corvette? Well, my grandmother's house is in foreclosure, but she doesn't want to sell my grandfather's vintage red Corvette. I said, what do you think your grandfather is telling your grandmother to do? Oh, like I never thought of that, you know, and and so I always when I use that example, I tell people, if you don't raise your hand, you might lose your house. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's a great one. That That is a great one. And, I, and I've, I've, I've been in demonstrations like that. And I've seen people just sit back with something very, very specific like that. And I know that drives mediums crazy. So um, we're actually coming to the end of our time. And that's a great way to close. Mark, I want to thank you for, for doing this again, for being here today, for helping people to understand how this all works. Uh, it's, it's been fantastic. So any closing words you'd like to, to have? Yeah, I, I would. Um, not long after my mother passed, she came through to me 
And in a very unexpected, I was senior partner of a law firm at the time Mm -hmm. and I was driving and I had to pull over because this like overwhelming message. And I heard her voice say, you must help people understand that the divine power you call God exists, that heaven, the afterlife, whatever you want to call it exists, that your souls are immortal living beings that humans can communicate with souls and that we will all be reunited in the light that you call God when it is your appointed time to leave the material world. So that's the five points I'd like to leave everyone with. Thank you for having me, Brian. God bless you. Great seeing you again. Have a good day.